This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 15 Of Tom's New Master and Various Other Matters. Since the thread of our humble hero's life has now become interwoven with that of higher ones, it is necessary to give some brief introduction to them. Augustine St. Clair was the son of a wealthy planter of Louisiana. The family had its origin in Canada. Of two brothers, very similar in temperament and character, one had settled on a flourishing farm in Vermont, and the other became an opulent planter in Louisiana. The mother of Augustine was a Huguenot French lady, whose family had emigrated to Louisiana during the days of its early settlement. Augustine and another brother were the only children of their parents. Having inherited from his mother an exceeding delicacy of constitution, he was, at the instance of physicians, during many years of his boyhood, sent to the care of his uncle in Vermont, in order that his constitution might be strengthened by the cold of a more bracing climate. In childhood he was remarkable for an extreme and marked sensitiveness of character, more akin to the softness of woman than the ordinary hardness of his own sex. Time, however, overgrew this softness with the rough bark of manhood, and but few knew how living and fresh it still lay at the core. His talents were of the very first order, although his mind showed a preference always for the ideal and the aesthetic, and there was about him that repugnance to the actual business of life which is the common result of this balance of the faculties. Soon after the completion of his college course, his whole nature was kindled into one intense and passionate effervescence of romantic passion. His hour came, the hour that comes only once. His star rose in the horizon. That star rises so often in vain, to be remembered only as a thing of dreams, and it rose for him in vain. To drop the figure, he saw and won the love of a high-minded and beautiful woman in one of the northern states, and they were affianced. He returned south to make arrangements for their marriage, when, most unexpectedly, his letters were returned to him by mail, with a short note from her guardian, stating to him that ere this reached him the lady would be the wife of another. Stung to madness, he vainly hoped, as many another has done, to fling the whole thing from his heart by one desperate effort. Too proud to supplicate or seek explanation, he threw himself at once into a whirl of fashionable society, and in a fortnight from the time of the fatal letter was the accepted lover of the reigning belle of the season. And as soon as arrangements could be made, he became the husband of a fine figure, a pair of bright dark eyes, and a hundred thousand dollars. And, of course, everybody thought him a happy fellow. The married couple were enjoying their honeymoon, and entertaining a brilliant circle of friends in their splendid villa near Lake Ponchartrain, when one day a letter was brought to him in that well-remembered writing. It was handed to him while he was in full tide of gay and successful conversation in a whole roomful of company. He turned deadly pale when he saw the writing, but still preserved his composure, and finished the playful warfare of badinage which he was at the moment carrying on with a lady opposite, and, a short time after, was missed from the circle. In his room, alone, he opened and read the letter, now worse than idle and useless to be read. It was from her, giving a long account of a persecution to which she had been exposed by her guardian's family, to lead her to unite herself with their son. And she related how, for a long time, his letters had ceased to arrive, how she had written time and again, till she became weary and doubtful, how her health had failed under her anxieties, and how, at last, she had discovered the whole fraud which had been practised on them both. The letter ended with expressions of hope and thankfulness, and professions of undying affection, which were more bitter than death to the unhappy young man. He wrote to her immediately, "'I have received yours, but too late. I believed all I heard. I was desperate. I am married, and all is over. Only forget. It is all that remains for either of us.' And thus ended the whole romance and ideal of life for Augustine St. Clair. But the real remained. 
the real, like the flat, bare, oozy tide mud, when the blue sparkling wave, with all its company of gliding boats and white-winged ships, its music of oars and chiming waters, has gone down, and there it lies, flat, slimy, bare, exceedingly real. Of course, in a novel, people's hearts break, and they die, and that is the end of it. And in a story this is very convenient. But in real life we do not die when all that makes life bright dies to us. There is a most busy and important round of eating, drinking, dressing, walking, visiting, buying, selling, talking, reading, and all that makes up what is commonly called living, yet to be gone through. And this yet remained to Augustine. Had his wife been a whole woman, she might yet have done something, as woman can, to mend the broken threads of life, and weave again into a tissue of brightness. But Marie St. Clair could not even see that they had been broken. As before stated, she consisted of a fine figure, a pair of splendid eyes, and a hundred thousand dollars. And none of these items were precisely the ones to minister to a mind diseased. When Augustine, pale as death, was found lying on the sofa, and pleaded sudden sick headache as the cause of his distress, she recommended to him to smell of hardshorn, and when the paleness and headache came on week after week, she only said that she never thought Mr. St. Clair was sickly, but it seems he was very liable to sick headaches, and that it was a very unfortunate thing for her, because he didn't enjoy going into company with her and it seemed odd to go so much alone, when they were just married. Augustine was glad in his heart that he had married so undiscerning a woman, but as the glosses and civilities of the honeymoon wore away, he discovered that a beautiful young woman, who has lived all her life to be caressed and waited on, might prove quite a hard mistress in domestic life. Marie never had possessed much capability of affection, or much sensibility, and the little that she had, had been merged into a most intense and unconscious selfishness, a selfishness the more hopeless from its quiet obtuseness, its utter ignorance of any claims but her own. From her infancy she had been surrounded with servants who lived only to study her caprices. The idea that they had either feelings or rights had never dawned upon her, even in distant perspective. Her father, whose only child she had been, had never denied her anything that lay within the compass of human possibility, and when she entered life, beautiful, accomplished, and an heiress, she had, of course, all the eligibles and non-eligibles of the other sex sighing at her feet, and she had no doubt that Augustine was a most fortunate man in having obtained her. It is a great mistake to suppose that a woman with no heart will be an easy creditor in the exchange of affection. There is not on earth a more merciless exactor of love from others than a thoroughly selfish woman, and the more unlovely she grows, the more jealously and scrupulously she exacts love, to the uttermost farthing. When, therefore, St. Clair began to drop off those gallantries and small attentions which flowed at first through the habitude of courtship, he found his sultana no way ready to resign her slave. There were abundance of tears, poutings, and small tempests. There were discontents, pinings, upbraidings. St. Clair was good-natured and self-indulgent, and sought to buy off with presents and flatteries. And when Marie became mother to a beautiful daughter, he really felt awakened, for a time, to something like tenderness. St. Clair's mother had been a woman of uncommon elevation and purity of character and he gave to his child his mother's name, fondly fancying that she would prove a reproduction of her image. The thing had been remarked with petulant jealousy by his wife, and she regarded her husband's absorbing devotion to the child with suspicion and dislike. All that was given to her seemed so much taken from herself. From the time of the birth of this child her health gradually sunk. A life of constant inaction, bodily and mental, the friction of ceaseless ennui and discontent, united to the ordinary weakness which attended the period of maternity, in course of a few years changed the blooming young belle into a yellow-faded sickly woman, whose time was divided among a variety of fanciful diseases, and who considered herself, in every sense, the most ill-used and suffering person in existence. There was no end of her various complaints 
but her principal forte appeared to lie in sick headache, which sometimes would confine her to her room three days out of six. As, of course, all family arrangements fell into the hands of servants, St. Clair found his menage anything but comfortable. His only daughter was exceedingly delicate, and he feared that, with no one to look after her and attend to her, her health and life might yet fall a sacrifice to her mother's inefficiency. He had taken her with him on a tour to Vermont, and had persuaded his cousin, Miss Ophelia St. Clair, to return with him to his southern residence, and they are now returning on this boat, where we have introduced them to our readers. And now, while the distant domes and spires of New Orleans rise to our view, there is yet time for an introduction to Miss Ophelia. Whoever has travelled in the New England States will remember, in some cool village, the large farmhouse, with its clean-swept grassy yard, shaded by the dense and massive foliage of the sugar-maple, and remember the air of order and stillness, of perpetuity and unchanging repose, that seemed to breathe over the whole place. Nothing lost or out of order, not a picket loose in the fence, not a particle of litter in the turfy yard with its clumps of lilac-bushes growing up under the windows. Within he will remember wide, clean rooms, where nothing ever seems to be doing or going to be done, where everything is once and forever rigidly in place, and where all household arrangements move with the punctual exactness of the old clock in the corner. In the family keeping-room, as it is termed, he will remember the staid, respectable old bookcase with its glass doors, where Rollins' History, Milton's Paradise Lost, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and Scott's Family Bible stand side by side in decorous order, with multitudes of other books equally solemn and respectable. There are no servants in the house, but the lady in the snowy cap with the spectacles, who sits sewing every afternoon among her daughters, as if nothing ever had been done or were to be done, she and her girls, in some long-forgotten forepart of the day, did up the work, and for the rest of the time, probably, at all hours when you would see them, it is done up. The old kitchen floor never seems stained or spotted. The tables, the chairs, and the various cooking utensils never seem deranged or disordered. Though three and sometimes four meals a day are got there, though the family washing and ironing is there performed, and though pounds of butter and cheese are in some silent and mysterious manner there brought into existence. On such a farm, in such a house and family, Miss Ophelia had spent a quiet existence of some forty-five years, when her cousin invited her to visit his southern mansion. The eldest of a large family, she was still considered by her father and mother as one of the children and the proposal that she should go to Orleans was a most momentous one to the family circle. The old grey-headed father took down Morse's atlas out of the bookcase, and looked out the exact latitude and longitude, and read Flint's travels in the south and west, to make up his own mind as to the nature of the country. The good mother inquired anxiously, if Orleans wasn't an awful wicked place, saying, that it seemed to her most equal to going on the Sandwich Islands or anywhere among the heathen. It was known at the minister's and at the doctor's, and at Miss Peabody's milliner's shop, that Ophelia St. Clair was talking about going away down to Orleans with her cousin, and of course the whole village could do no less than help this very important process of taking about the matter. The minister, who inclined strongly to abolitionist views, was quite doubtful whether such a step might not tend somewhat to encourage the Southerners in holding on to their slaves, while the doctor, who was a staunch colonizationist, inclined to the opinion that Miss Ophelia ought to go, to show the Orleans people that we don't think hardly of them, after all. He was of opinion, in fact, that Southern people needed encouraging. When, however, the fact that she had resolved to go was fully before the public mind, she was solemnly invited out to tea by all her friends and neighbors for the space of a fortnight, and her prospects and plans duly canvassed and inquired into. Miss Mosley, who came into the house to help to do the dressmaking, acquired daily accessions of importance from the developments with regard to Miss Ophelia's wardrobe, which she had been enabled to make. It was credibly ascertained that Squire Sinclair, as his name was commonly contracted in the neighborhood, had counted out fifty dollars and given them to Miss Ophelia, 
and told her to buy any clothes she thought best, and that two new silk dresses and a bonnet had been sent for from Boston. As to the propriety of this extraordinary outlay, the public mind was divided, some affirming that it was well enough, all things considered, for once in one's life, and others stoutly affirming that the money had better have been sent to the missionaries. But all parties agreed that there had been no such parasol seen in those parts as had been sent on from New York, and that she had one silk dress that might fairly be trusted to stand alone, whatever might be said of its mistress. There were credible rumors, also, of a hem-stitched pocket-handkerchief, and report even went so far as to state that Miss Ophelia had one pocket-handkerchief with lace all around it. It was even added that it was worked in the corners. But this latter point was never satisfactorily ascertained, and remains, in fact, unsettled to this day. Miss Ophelia, as you now behold her, stands before you in a very shining brown linen travelling dress tall, square-formed, and angular. Her face was thin, and rather sharp in its outlines, the lips compressed, like those of a person who is in the habit of making up her mind definitely on all subjects. While the keen dark eyes had a peculiarly searching, advised movement, and travelled over everything, as if they were looking for something to take care of. All her movements were sharp, decided, and energetic and though she was never much of a talker, her words were remarkably direct, and to the purpose, when she did speak. In her habits she was a living impersonation of order, method, and exactness. In punctuality she was as inevitable as a clock, and as inexorable as a railroad engine, and she held in most decided contempt and abomination anything of a contrary character. The great sin of sins, in her eyes, the sum of all evils, was expressed by one very common and important word in her vocabulary, shiftlessness. Her finale and ultimatum of contempt consisted in a very emphatic pronunciation of the word shiftless, and by this she characterized all modes of procedure which had not a direct and inevitable relation to accomplishment of some purpose then definitely had in mind. People who did nothing, or who did not know exactly what they were going to do, or who did not take the most direct way to accomplish what they set their hands to, were objects of her entire contempt, a contempt shown less frequently by anything she said than by a kind of stony grimness, as if she scorned to say anything about the matter. As to mental cultivation, she had a clear, strong, active mind, was well and thoroughly read in history and the older English classics and thought with great strength within certain narrow limits. Her theological tenets were all made up, labelled in most positive and distinct forms, and put by, like the bundles in her patched trunk. There were just so many of them, and there were never to be any more. So also were her ideas with regard to most matters of practical life, such as housekeeping in all its branches, and the various political relations of her native village. And, underlying all, deeper than anything else, Higher and broader lay the strongest principle of her being, conscientiousness. Nowhere is conscience so dominant and all-absorbing as with New England women. It is the granite formation which lies deepest and rises out even to the tops of the highest mountains. Miss Ophelia was the absolute bond-slave of the ought. Once make her certain that the path of duty, as she commonly phrased it, lay in any given direction, and fire and water could not keep her from it. She would walk straight down into a well, or up to a loaded cannon's mouth, if she were only quite sure that there the path lay. Her standard of right was so high, so all-embracing, so minute, and making so few concessions to human frailty, that, though she strove with heroic ardour to reach it, she never actually did so, and, of course, was burdened with a constant and often harassing sense of deficiency. This gave a severe and somewhat gloomy cast to her religious character. But how in the world can Miss Ophelia get along with Augustine St. Clair? Gay, easy, unpunctual, unpractical, sceptical, in short, walking with impudent and nonchalant freedom over every one of her most cherished habits and opinions. To tell the truth, then, Miss Ophelia loved him. When a boy it had been hers to teach him his catechism, mend his clothes, comb his hair, and bring him up generally in the way he should go. 
and her heart having a warm side to it, Augustine had, as he usually did with most people, monopolized a large share of it for himself. And therefore it was that he succeeded very easily in persuading her that the path of duty lay in the direction of New Orleans, and that she must go with him to take care of Eva, and keep everything from going to wreck and ruin during the frequent illnesses of his wife. The idea of a house without anybody to take care of it went to her heart. Then she loved the lovely little girl, as few could help doing, and though she regarded Augustine as very much of a heathen, yet she loved him, laughed at his jokes, and forbore with his failings, to an extent which those who knew him thought perfectly incredible. But what more or other is to be known of Miss Ophelia our reader must discover by a personal acquaintance. There she is, sitting now in her stateroom, surrounded by a mixed multitude of little and big carpet-bags, boxes, baskets, each containing some separate responsibility which she is tying, binding up, packing, or fastening, with a face of great earnestness. "'Now, Eva, have you kept count of your things? Of course you haven't. Children never do. There's the spotted carpet-bag and the little blue bandbox with your best bonnet. That's two then the india-rubber satchel is three, and my tape and needle-box is four, and my band-box five, and my collar-box, and that little hair-trunk seven. What have you done with your sunshade? Give it to me, and let me put a paper round it, and tie it to my umbrella with my shade. There, now. Why, Auntie, we are only going up home. What is the use? To keep it nice, child, people must take care of their things, if they ever mean to have anything. And now, Eva, is your thimble put up? Really, Auntie, I don't know. Well, never mind. I'll look your box over. Thimble, wax, two spools, scissors, knife, tape needle. All right, put it in here. What did you ever do, child, when you were coming on with only your papa? I should have thought you'd have lost everything you had. Well, Auntie, I did lose a great many. And then, when we stopped anywhere, papa would buy some more of whatever it was. "'Mercy on us, child! What a way!' "'It was a very easy way, Auntie,' said Eva. "'It's a dreadful shiftless one,' said Auntie. "'Why, Auntie, what'll you do now?' said Eva. "'That trunk is too full to be shut down.' "'It must shut down,' said Auntie, with the air of a general, as she squeezed the things in and sprung upon the lid. Still a little gap remained about the mouth of the trunk. "'Get up here, Eva,' said Miss Ophelia courageously. What has been done can be done again. This trunk has got to be shut and locked. There are no two ways about it." And the trunk, intimidated, doubtless, by this resolute statement, gave in. The hasp snapped sharply in its hole, and Miss Ophelia turned the key and pocketed it in triumph. "'Now we're ready. Where's your papa? I think it time this baggage was set out. Do look out, Eva, and see if you see your papa." "'Oh, yes, he's down the other end of the gentleman's cabin, eating an orange. He can't know how near we are coming," said Auntie. "'Hadn't you better run and speak to him?' "'Papa never is in a hurry about anything,' said Eva. "'And we haven't come to the landing. Do step on the guards, Auntie. Look, there's our house, up that street.' The boat now began, with heavy groans, like some vast tired monster, to prepare to push up among the multiplied steamers at the levee. Eva joyously pointed out the various spires, domes, and waymarks by which she recognized her native city. "'Yes, yes, dear, very fine,' said Miss Ophelia. "'But mercy on us, the boat has stopped. Where is your father?' And now ensued the usual turmoil of landing, waiters running twenty ways at once, men tugging trunks, carpet-bags, boxes, women anxiously calling to their children, and everybody crowding in a dense mass to the plank towards the landing. Miss Ophelia seated herself resolutely on the lately vanquished trunk, and, marshalling all her goods and chattels in fine military order, seemed resolved to defend them to the last. "'Shall I take your trunk, ma'am?' "'Shall I take your baggage? Let me tend to your baggage, missus. Shan't I carry out these yar, missus?' rained down upon her unheeded. She sat with grim determination, upright as a darning-needle stuck in a board, holding on her bundle of umbrella and parasols, and replying with a determination that was enough to strike dismay even into a hackman, wondering to Eva, in each interval, what upon earth her papa could be thinking of. He couldn't have fallen over now, but something must have happened. And just as she had begun to work herself into a real distress, he came up, 
with his usually careless motion, and giving Eva a quarter of the orange he was eating, said, "'Well, Cousin Vermont, I suppose you are all ready.' "'I've been ready, waiting, nearly an hour,' said Miss Ophelia. "'I began to be really concerned about you.' "'That's a clever fellow, now,' said he. "'Well, the carriage is waiting, and the crowd are now off, so that one can walk out in a decent and Christian manner, and not be pushed and shoved. Here,' he added to a driver who stood behind him, "'take these things.' "'I'll go and see to his putting them in,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Oh, pshaw, cousin, what's the use?' said St. Clair. "'Well, at any rate, I'll carry this, and this, and this,' said Miss Ophelia, singling out three boxes and a small carpet-bag. "'My dear Miss Vermont, positively you mustn't come the green mountains over us that way. You must adopt at least a piece of a southern principle, and not walk out under all that load. They'll take you for a waiting-maid. Give them to this fellow. He'll put them down as if they were eggs now.' Miss Ophelia looked despairingly as her cousin took all her treasures from her, and rejoiced to find herself once more in the carriage with them, in a state of preservation. "'Where's Tom?' said Eva. "'Oh, he's on the outside, Pussy. I'm going to take Tom up to Mother for a peace-offering, to make up for that drunken fellow that upset the carriage.' "'Oh, Tom will make a splendid driver, I know,' said Eva. "'He'll never get drunk.' The carriage stopped in front of an ancient mansion built in that odd mixture of Spanish and French style, of which there are specimens in some parts of New Orleans. It was built in the Moorish fashion, a square building enclosing a courtyard, into which the carriage drove through an arched gateway. The court, in the inside, had evidently been arranged to gratify a picturesque and voluptuous ideality. Wide galleries ran all around the four sides, whose Moorish arches, slender pillars, and arabesque ornaments carried the mind back, as in a dream, to the reign of oriental romance in Spain. In the middle of the court a fountain threw high its silvery water, falling in a never-ceasing spray into a marble basin, fringed with a deep border of fragrant violets. The water in the fountain, pellucid as crystal, was alive with myriads of gold and silver fishes, twinkling and darting through it like so many living jewels. Around the fountain ran a walk, paved with a mosaic of pebbles, laid in various fanciful patterns, and this, again, was surrounded by turf, smooth as green velvet, while a carriage-drive enclosed the whole. Two large orange-trees, now fragrant with blossoms, threw a delicious shade, and, ranged in a circle round upon the turf, were marble vases of arabesque sculpture, containing the choicest flowering plants of the tropics huge pomegranate trees, with their glossy leaves and flame-coloured flowers, dark-leaved Arabian jasmines, with their silvery stars, geraniums, luxuriant roses, bending beneath their heavy abundance of flowers, golden jasmines, lemon-scented verbenum, all united their bloom and fragrance, while here and there a mystic old aloe, with its strange massive leaves, sat looking like some old enchanter, sitting in weird grandeur among the more perishable bloom and fragrance around it. The galleries that surrounded the court were festooned with a curtain of some kind of Moorish stuff, and could be drawn down at pleasure to exclude the beams of the sun. On the whole the appearance of the place was luxurious and romantic. As the carriage drove in, Eva seemed like a bird ready to burst from a cage with the wild eagerness of her delight. "'Oh, isn't it beautiful, lovely!' "'My own dear darling home,' she said to Miss Ophelia. "'Isn't it beautiful?' "'Tis a pretty place,' said Ophelia, as she alighted, "'though it looks rather old and heathenish to me.' Tom got down from the carriage, and looked about with an air of calm, still enjoyment. The negro, it must be remembered, is an exotic of the most gorgeous and superb countries of the world, and he has, deep in his heart, a passion for all that is splendid, rich, and fanciful a passion which, rudely indulged by an untrained taste, draws on them the ridicule of the colder and more correct white race. St. Clair, who was in heart a poetical voluptuary, smiled as Miss Ophelia made her remark on his premises, and, turning to Tom, who was standing looking around, his beaming black face perfectly radiant with admiration, he said, "'Tom, my boy, this seems to suit you.' "'Yes, massa, it looks about the right thing,' said Tom. 
All this passed in a moment, while trunks were being hustled off, hackmen paid, and while a crowd of all ages and sizes, men, women, and children, came running through the galleries, both above and below, to see Massa come in. Foremost among them was a highly dressed young mulatto man, evidently a very distingué personage, attired in the ultra-extreme of the mode, and gracefully waving a scented cambric handkerchief in his hand. This personage had been exerting himself, with great alacrity, in driving all the flock of domestics to the other end of the veranda. "'Back! All of you! I am ashamed of you!' he said, in a tone of authority. "'Would you intrude on Master's domestic relations, in the first hour of his return?' All looked abashed at this elegant speech, delivered with quite an air, and stood huddled together at a respectful distance, except two stout porters, who came up and began conveying away the baggage. Owing to Mr. Adolph's systematic arrangements, when St. Clair turned round from paying the hackman, there was nobody in view but Mr. Adolph himself, conspicuous in satin vest, gold guard chain, and white pants, and bowing with inexpressible grace and suavity. "'Ah, Adolph, it is you,' said his master, offering his hand to him. "'How are you, boy?' while Adolph poured forth with great fluency an extemporary speech, which he had been preparing with great care for a fortnight before. "'Well, well,' said St. Clair, passing on, with his usual air of negligent drollery. "'That's very well got up, Adolph. See that the baggage is well bestowed. I'll come to the people in a minute.' And, so saying, he led Miss Ophelia to a large parlour that opened on the veranda. While this had been passing, Eva had flown like a bird through the porch and parlour to a little boudoir opening likewise on the veranda. A tall, dark-eyed, sallow woman half rose from a couch on which she was reclining. Mama said Eva, in a sort of a rapture, throwing herself on her neck and embracing her over and over again. "'That'll do. Take care, child. Don't. You make my head ache,' said the mother, after she had languidly kissed her. St. Clair came in, embraced his wife in true orthodox, husbandly fashion, and then presented to her his cousin. Marie lifted her large eyes on her cousin with an air of some curiosity, and received her with languid politeness. A crowd of servants now pressed to the entry door, and among them a middle-aged mulatto woman, of very respectable appearance, stood foremost, in a tremor of expectation and joy at the door. "'Oh, there's Mammy!' said Eva, as she flew across the room, and, throwing herself into her arms, she kissed her repeatedly. This woman did not tell her that she made her head ache, but, on the contrary, she hugged her, and laughed, and cried, till her sanity was a thing to be doubted of, and when released from her, Eva flew from one to another, shaking hands and kissing, in a way that Miss Ophelia afterwards declared fairly turned her stomach. "'Well,' said Miss Ophelia, you southern children can do something that I couldn't. What now, pray? said St. Clair. Well, I want to be kind to everybody, and I wouldn't have anything hurt. But as to kissing— Niggers, said St. Clair. That you're not up to, hey? Yes, that's it. How can she? St. Clair laughed as he went into the passage. Hello, here. What's to pay out here? Here, you all. Mammy, Jimmy, Polly, Suki. Glad to see Massa he said, as he went shaking hands from one to another. "'Look out for the babies,' he added, as he stumbled over a sooty little urchin, who was crawling upon all fours. "'If I step upon anybody, let him mention it.' There was an abundance of laughing and blessing Masser, as St. Clair distributed small pieces of change among them. "'Come, now, take yourselves off, like good boys and girls,' he said, and the whole assemblage, dark and light, disappeared through a door into a large veranda, followed by Eva who carried a large satchel, which she had been filling with apples, nuts, candy, ribbons, laces, and toys of every description, during her whole homeward journey. As St. Clair turned to go back, his eye fell upon Tom, who was standing uneasily, shifting from one foot to the other, while Adolph stood negligently leaning against the banisters, examining Tom through an opera-glass, with an air that would have done credit to any dandy living. "'Puh! You puppy!' said his master, striking down the opera-glass. "'Is that the way you treat your company? Seems to me, Dolph,' he added, laying his finger on the elegant-figured satin vest that Adolph was sporting, "'seems to me that's my vest.' "'Oh, Massa, this vest all stained with wine! Of course, a gentleman in master's standing never wears a vest like this. I understood I was to take it. It does for a poor nigger-fellow like me.' 
and Adolf tossed his head and passed his fingers through his scented hair with a grace. "'So that's it, is it?' said St. Clair carelessly. "'Well, here. I'm going to show this Tom to his mistress, and then you take him to the kitchen, and mind you don't put on any of your airs to him. He's worth two such puppies as you.' "'Master always will have his joke,' said Adolf, laughing. "'I'm delighted to see Master in such spirits.' "'Here, Tom,' said St. Clair, beckoning. Tom entered the room. He looked wistfully on the velvet carpets, and the before unimagined splendors of mirrors, pictures, statues, and curtains, and, like the Queen of Sheba before Solomon, there was no more spirit in him. He looked afraid even to set his feet down. "'See here, Marie,' said St. Clair to his wife. I've brought you a coachman, at last, to order. I tell you, he's a regular hearse for blackness and sobriety, and will drive you like a funeral, if you want. Open your eyes now, and look at him. Now, don't say I never think about you when I'm gone." Marie opened her eyes, and fixed them on Tom, without rising. "'I know he'll get drunk,' she said. "'No. He's warranted a pious and sober article.' "'Well, I hope he may turn out well,' said the lady. It's more than I expect, though." "'Dolph,' said St. Clair, "'show Tom downstairs. And mind yourself,' he added, "'remember what I told you.' Adolph tripped gracefully forward, and Tom, with lumbering tread, went after. "'He's a perfect behemoth,' said Marie. "'Come now, Marie,' said St. Clair, seating himself on a stool beside her sofa. "'Be gracious, and say something pretty to a fellow.' "'You've been gone a fortnight beyond the time,' said the lady, pouting. "'Well, you know I wrote you the reason.' "'Such a short, cold letter,' said the lady. "'Dear me, the mail was just going, and it had to be that or nothing.' "'That's just the way, always,' said the lady. "'Always something to make your journeys long, and letters short.' "'See here now,' he added, drawing an elegant velvet case out of his pocket and opening it. "'Here's a present I got for you in New York. It was a daguerreotype, clear and soft as an engraving representing Eva and her father, sitting hand in hand. Marie looked at it with a dissatisfied air. "'What made you sit in such an awkward position?' she said. "'Well, the position may be a matter of opinion, but what do you think of the likeness?' "'If you don't think anything of my opinion in one case, I suppose you wouldn't in another,' said the lady, shutting the daguerreotype. "'Hang the woman,' said St. Clair mentally, but aloud he added, "'Come now, Marie. What do you think of the likeness? Don't be nonsensical now." "'It's very inconsiderate of you, St. Clair,' said the lady, "'to insist on my talking and looking at things. You know I've been lying all day with a sick headache, and there's been such a tumult made ever since you came. I'm half dead.' "'You're subject to the sick headache, ma'am?' said Miss Ophelia, suddenly rising from the depths of the large arm-chair where she had sat quietly, taking an inventory of the furniture and calculating its expense. "'Yes, I'm a perfect martyr to it,' said the lady. "'Juniper berry tea is good for sick headache,' said Miss Ophelia. "'At least, August, Dean Abraham Perry's wife, used to say so, and she was a great nurse.' "'I'll have the first juniper berries that get ripe in our garden by the lake brought in for that special purpose,' said St. Clair, gravely pulling the bell as he did so. "'Meanwhile, cousin, you must be wanting to retire to your apartment and refresh yourself a little after your journey.' Dolph, he added, tell Mammy to come here. The decent mulatto woman, whom Eva had caressed so rapturously, soon entered. She was dressed neatly, with a high red and yellow turban on her head, the recent gift of Eva, and which the child had been arranging on her head. Mammy, said St. Clair, I put this lady under your care. She is tired and wants rest. Take her to her chamber, and be sure she is made comfortable. And Miss Ophelia disappeared in the rear of Mammy. End of chapter 15